Hi, welcome to Ethereal Mechanics, uh, video number 46. This is uh, Michael Samorley and the Absolute Reference Frame. Hello, my name is Robert Justinti. I'm an electrical engineer with 30 years experience. This video is a continuation of the breaking relativity video, video number 45. And here we're going to discuss the Michael Samorley experiment with respect to the Absolute Reference Frame. Uh, the Absolute Reference Frame is what I call the velocity of an object relative to the ether. Uh, these are videos, a little bit of recap of video 19. Okay, over 100 years ago, scientists noted that light had similar properties to other known wave phenomena. For example, and so they said, well, okay, you know, if string waves travel over a string and water waves travel over water and sound waves travel through the air, those are all the mediums of the waves. And so they postulated that light must have a medium as well. So what was the medium for light? Was it air? Well, they tried evacuating uh, a cylinder and they found that the light still traveled through a vacuum. So light can travel through a vacuum so it's not air. <clears throat> so they assume that if a medium exists, it must be finer than air, capable of filling the empty space between all known matter. This medium was dubbed the luminiferous ether. Um, and a is used in the old ether. I don't use the A to distinguish my ether from the old ether. My ether is not very fine. It's incredibly dense. It's matter, which is fine. But you can go to video Ghost in the Ether to get more understanding of my ether model. So what are the assumptions that they made? They made the assumption that the ether is stationary with respect to the universe uh, and that the sun and the earth move through this stationary ether. And if the above are true, then it should be a, we should be able to measure the speed of the Earth relative to the ether. So what was the expected speed? Well, the Sun moves at 220 kilometers per second relative to the galactic core, and the Earth moves 30 kilometers per second in its orbit about the Sun. Okay, so at the very least, we should measure at least 30 kilometers per second, at the very least probably something bigger than that. So they made the experiment capable of detecting uh, 30 kilometers per second at the minimum. Well, it actually can detect smaller than that, but 30 kilometers per second was what they expected to measure at the minimum. Okay, and the experiment was the Michelson-Morley experiment. This experiment was designed to measure the velocity of the Earth relative to the ether. And then the basic concepts are as follows. Uh, if you want to measure a wave relative to a medium, you can and visualize a boat traveling on the water. And if the boat's stationary and, and you disturb the water, the waves are going to travel a certain velocity and hit a detector on the front side of the boat. But if the boat is in motion, that front detector is going to outrun for a short while the waves. And therefore, from this model here, you can detect knowing the velocity of the waves in the medium from that you can detect your velocity relative to the medium. Okay, but the question is here, we're using light waves to observe the water waves. How do we observe light waves? Well, the answer is we use light waves to observe light waves. And we do this through a technique called interferometry. Whereas if you have a reference wave and the wave you're trying to measure, and lambda is the term for the wavelength of the wave, well, if you have the reference and the test wave arrive at the same time at a screen, the positives and the negatives will all add what they call positive con uh, constructive interference, and you get a very bright beam. On the other hand, if your test wave arrives 180 degrees out of phase, well, the positive of the test wave is going to cancel with the negative of the, of the reference wave, and vice versa all the way down, you're going to get a dark spot. Okay, so the, how the waves can interfere with each other, you can do a measurement. But what about Doppler shift? I mean, if we're in motion, there should be a Doppler shift, right? No. Uh, if you go back to the train example in video number 22, you'll find that as long as the source and the observers move together, they will not experience a Doppler shift. Whereas objects that are not moving with the reference frame of the source and the detector will experience Doppler shift. But since the experiment, the Michelson Morley, is on a granite slab where all the sources and reflectors and mirrors and detectors all move together, we should not expect any Doppler shift. So how does the Michelson Morley interferometer work? Well, over here we have a source generating light waves. That's going to hit a partially reflective mirror. Part of the beam is going to go in one direction, the other part of the beam is going to go in the other direction. 
I mean, some of the half the energy is going to go one way, the other half of the is going to go the other way. Okay, this beam is going to reflect off this mirror and go straight through, and this beam is going to reflect off this mirror and get reflected down. And when these two beams arrive, they're going to de either detect a fringe shift or not based on if there's a difference in how in either direction. In other words, if the ether is moving in this direction, you should expect a difference in the way time it takes for this beam to go up and down as opposed to it is for this beam to go come back and forth. And because of that motion, you should be able to detect a number of fringe shifts, we call it, over here. The number of wavelengths that get changed. And that number of wavelengths should be dependent on your velocity relative to the medium. Okay, so if we derive the equation for the longitudinal, let's say the velocity of the experiment with respect to ether is moving this way, and this is uh, this is this area blown up, so I can put stuff up here. And so the time for the uh, the longitudinal is the forward time of the beam to go hit, you know, to go from the mirror to hit the ref this reflecting mirror. And because the beam is is going at the velocity of c, but our experiment is moving away at the velocity of v, we can only close at a velocity of c minus v. And d is the distance of the of the arm, so we take d divided by c minus v. Gives, that gives us the forward time. On the reverse, once the beam reflects, now the velocity c is working with. In other words, this mirror is closing at velocity v, and the light beam is coming back at velocity c. So we're closing at a velocity of c plus v. And so our reflection, the time it takes for the reflected beam to come back, is d over c plus v. So our total time it takes for this beam to go forward, hit the mirror, and come back is the sum of these two guys here, which is shown here, and this can be reduced to this equation here. So that's the time for the longitudinal. Longitudinal means moving in the direction that we're moving. That's the longitudinal. Now we're going to detect, determine the equations for the transverse. This is a little bit more complicated, requires a little bit more algebra, but essentially what happens is a beam of light is going to go out and they, we use an isotropic radiator, and one path of that beam is going to hit the mirror just right, and then that's going to be reflected back. Okay, and so what we want to do then is say, well, the time it takes for the beam to come out and come back, during that time, the mirror is going to move a distance of y, which is velocity times time. And I'm not going to go through all these calculations for you guys can go through these calculations, but you end up with this equation here. So if we put these together, and we can show them side by side, you see that they're, they're almost the same except this guy has a square root on this v over c term where this guy is straight. Okay, and so they decided from that difference there they could detect the velocity of us relative to the ether. Now in the 1887 experiment Okay, it's a little convoluted because you see a lot of different mirrors. And the reason for that is they wanted to make the experiment as big as possible but keep it in a very small footprint. So what they did was, here's the source, and what they did is they just kept bouncing it back and forth to kind of give it the effective distance of 11 meters even though it's really on a small table. Okay, and again, here's our partially uh, reflective mirror which sends the other beam the other way. Or maybe it's this guy. I don't remember which one it is. Maybe this is the source and that. Oh, sorry. That's the source and that's the detector over here. Okay, so that's why they're folding the path. They're, mul they're multiplying the effective length by folding the light path back and forth in order to get more sensitivity. Because the longer the arms are, the more sensitive it is, the more fringe shift you expect. So we take the total time difference as the longitudinal time minus the transverse time. Okay, and that's the time. But because what they're going to do on this experiment here, they have it this way. You see these numbers around the base? What they're going to do is they're going to rotate the experiment so that the arms of the experiment are going to rotate through. So if the ether is going this way, we're going to get um, the T diff in one direction. And then if once we rotate the other arm, then we should expect minus T diff because now the other arm is going to be. And so the total displacement should be two times t diff because of the rotation. And that's why we have two t diff here because as we rotate it, the, the peak to peak displacement should be twice the displacement as if the thing were in one direction. 
And this is the approximate value you get from uh, Wikipedia. And so using that the velocity of the Earth relative to the sun is uh, 30,000 kilometers, I'm sorry, 30,000 meters per second, and the, the velocity of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th, the length of the experiment arms is 11 meters, and lambda, the light they use is 500 nanometers, and that should see a fringe shift of 0.44. That's the number of wavelengths, almost a half a wavelength of fringe shift you should see with these numbers. And these were the results. Let me explain these to you. These dotted lines is what they were expecting to see. They're not to scale. These should have been uh, plus 0.22 to minus 0.22. Okay, but you know, they, so they really are bigger. They just show them there. It's not the real scale. But their sensitivity of their experiment was 0 0.05 lambda. Okay, so and their detections over that period. This is for each rotation of the experiment. Here, this is where one the, a particular arm is from north to south. Here that particular arm rotates into the east to west position, and here it goes from the south to north position. Okay, and in that rotation of that, you can see each of the number of different points here from the little inflections. So they took one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine measurements. This one is done, this section was done at one part of the day, this, section, this one was done at another part of the day, I think six hours different from each other. And at each time they took nine measurements as they're rotating the machine through. And you can see they got something, but that could be easily, uh, you know, that, I mean, it's too random. It's probably a measurement error or noise, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so the, the results are essentially null. Why did they get a null reading? We're going to explain that in a second, but let me just go back and put a little disclaimer. My older publications, which include newgravity.pdf, I assume that since the tangential acceleration of the ether relative to the surface of the Earth is zero, that the tangential velocity of the ether must also be zero. Okay, but even if that were the case, it's still not sufficient to explain Michelson-Morley experiment. Because even if the surface velocity of ether is equal to zero, you should still be able to use that interferometer to measure your velocity of a train or something that really is in motion relative to the ether. But we can't. So there needs to be more explanation of why the dual arm interferometer cannot measure velocity no matter what you do with it. Um, so what does the ethereal mechanics say? Well, in video 23, and you can go there for more detail, the equatorial velocity of the Earth is 421 meters per second. The equatorial velocity of the ether, tangent equatorial velocity of the ether, is 7,900 meters per second. So the surface velocity of the ether at the equator is about 7,800 meters per second. Let's say that at 45 latitude that drops to 550 meters per second. Because uh, this experiment was not done at the equator. It was done probably in England or Europe somewhere. It was in America. I don't know where it was done. But it was, it was done in the northern hemisphere. Okay, so if the fringe shift, uh, they were expecting for a 30 kilometer per second speed is really being modulated by a 5,500 meter per second speed, then we should expect 0 0.08 of a fringe shift, which would be 0 0.04. And that's within the capabilities of the experiment. Okay, because see here, they're able to measure down to 0 0.05. So a deflection of this height, plus or minus, would have been measurable within the realm of the experiment. Okay, and this is the little calculation I use. This is from video number 23. So if the Michelson-Morley could have measured the ether, it should have measured the ether. And granted, that, that uh, this 7,900, uh, 7.9 kilometers per second is at the equator, it's like this. So it wouldn't matter what time of day they measured it. So along comes an engineer named Oliver Heaviside. He demonstrated the Coulomb field compresses in the direction of velocity. Interesting that if you have imbalanced charge, you can measure velocity. You can detect an effect related to velocity. And there's a thing called the heavy side ellipsoid, if you want to go look for more detail there. I don't know if that's on Wikipedia. So in order for physicists to save the ether model, they postulate that matter must compress as well. And if you read out uh, Wikipedia, they say it's kind of ad hoc. Um, and Oliver Heaviside did some fantastic stuff here. Uh, this is only a little bit of it. You can go to Wikipedia, Oliver Heaviside. But one of the things that Wikipedia wrote about him is that he was at odds with the scientific establishment for most of his life. 
Uh, Heaviside changed the face of mathematics and science for years to come. This guy was self-taught. Seems like most of the people that come out and change the world are self-taught, like the Wright brothers were self-taught. So they weren't pre-biased by what other people in the industry or the academia were thinking of the day. So what the physicists did is they took his idea and formulated it into the Lawrence, Lorentz Fitzgerald contraction, which is basically a fudge factor. Now, why they write it, they usually write it as the reciprocal, which is shown here. I don't know why. If it's length contraction, then as velocity increases, this number should get smaller, but it gets smaller when you write it this way, as opposed to 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. This number gets bigger as the velocity gets bigger. So why they write it the other way around, I don't know. This makes more sense to me, so I write it this way, and I show the way their symbol for it upside down, so whatever. So you multiply this factor times the top of the longitudinal because it's only in the longitudinal direction that we have contraction. And because you have this guy which is a to the one and on the top this is basically to the one half then you end up with the, the longitudinal time will now be identical to the transverse time. And in uh, ethereal mechanics when we get to the preton models I'll show you exactly what goes on in subatomic particles that cause them to actually length contract. But here's the rub. The v in this equation is the velocity relative to the medium, aka the ether. And then what mecha me ether mechan um, ethereal mechanics calls this the absolute velocity for brevity. Absolute velocity is kind of a misnomer, but it, you know it's your, your velocity relative to ether. I call the absolute velocity because that's the only thing that makes any is the only thing that's of absolutely any value to electromagnetic physics. Any effect which is motion sensitive is the interaction of a body to a medium. So time dilation, which ethereal mechanics calls process dilation, you know, if you're moving through empty space, how do you know to, to length contract or time dilate or whatever you're going to do? You've got to be interacting with something, so you have the information in order to length to, to do something. For example, if I wave my hand in the air, I'm not going to generate water waves. I need to be waving my hand in water waves to generate water waves. Okay, so if there's no medium, what does your object use as a reference to contract relative to, or to time dilate relative, or to generate a magnetic field relative to? Okay, and so all of this stuff the time dilation, length contract, which is really process, and length contraction, inertia, magnetic fields, that is all the velocity of an object relative to a medium. It has to be. can't just be empty space. Otherwise, what would your object know to use as a reference frame for how it's going to deform itself? As it go out there and make measurements of the other star and say, oh, I'm moving at half the speed of light, I've got to do some length contracting. No. It's got to be happening the information has to be right there where the object is while it's in motion. The absolute immediate reference frame has to provide the information. Therefore, the space must be contain something. And their very equation says the velocity relative to the medium. And we give you an example of what I was trying to get at before. An example of a crushing force from the medium. If you take a bubble on the little bubble stick they gave you in the bubble bottle and you move that relative to the air, that bubble is going to compress because of its motion relative to the medium of the air. And you're on a roller coaster, it's your inertia that crushes you against the seat of the roller coaster. Okay, we only feel the coupling to the medium due to acceleration. We do not feel the medium, the, the, an effect of the medium relative to velocity, except at uh, these for these other experiments. But as far as inertia goes, that's all we feel. And why is that? Well, when we go back to Mother Nature's gateways from video number 44, in order for us humans to figure things out, our observations must be that of a stationary, stable environment until our footprint expands. In other words, we're sitting on the Earth, and we're a primitive species, let's say. We can't have prior knowledge of space and all that stuff. If we're going to do simple experiments using water to do, you know, aqueducts and simple things they did in the Roman days, your stuff has to work reliably all the time. Otherwise, you're not going to build them. It's like it doesn't work because, you know, the earth is going this way and that's going to cause tremendous forces because we're moving relative to the ether and it's going to... So, in order for us to get a leg up, all of our observations need to be as if we're in a stable 
stationary reference frame. Otherwise, science probably would have never developed unless our observations are repeatable until we learned about the bigger picture. And otherwise, you know, if, if we were going to be, you know, reacted on by the ether, the velocity of the ether, then between day and night, there would be a 60 kilometer shift, a 60 kilometer per second shift over the course of the day. That would have probably made life too fragile to even be able, the life would have been too fragile to even evolve. So Mother Nature does a good job at making things look simple to us until our footprint expands. And our footprint will expand because the compensations for the Michelson-Morley experiment break down at higher velocities. Remember the divergence diagram from video 44. As our footprint expands, things are going to diverge from what we thought was the irrefutable model over here. And I'm going to show you only one example of a few that I've explored. One of the problems we had with the Michelson-Morley experiment is that we're using beams of light very narrow beams of light but our modeling as is if is as if the light is an isotropic wave and that presents a problem because it, at at lower velocities it's not a problem at zero velocity it's absolutely not a problem but if we consider what a narrow beam looks like and we're using I'm using a sine x over x a sync function and obviously this is going to be a lot narrower for a, like say a, a coherent laser beam and what this is, this is the angle off bore site of the laser beam. And the isotropic radiator would be up here. Over any angle, it's going to have the same amplitude. And it's going to have the same phase. Okay, but for a narrow beam, as you start getting off bore site, not only is your amplitude going to drop, but your phase is going to change. Your phase is going to go, let's say the phase up here is plus 90 degrees just picking an odd phase. Well, when you get down here, this is going to be minus 90 degrees. 180 degree phase shift from here to here. So as you start moving off boresight, your phase is going to change. If your phase changes, your fringes are going to shift a lot more than they would if you had a simple uh, isotropic radiated pattern. Okay, because let's say, you know, at 5 kilometers per second, this mirror is going to intercept the beam at 0 0.001 degrees and if you have an extremely narrow laser beam that could be a tremendous phase shift. More phase shift than you would have exper expected with the simple Michelson-Morley approximation that waves are a isotropic wavefront. Isotropic mean radiating the same in all directions. Okay so the Michelson-Morley compensations will break down and even worse at higher velocities emit this wave, that mirror is going to move out of the way before the wave even gets there, the light beam even gets there. You're going to miss it all together. It's got to because our compensations for the Lorentz uh, Fitzgerald are based on the fact that our light beam moves in the reference frame of the medium. So if you're moving at incredible velocity relative to the medium, you have the possibility of missing the little mirror altogether. Just like the train example. If you had a high enough cross velocity, you'd blow those sound waves away and the conductor would never hear it. Of course, that, that kind of velocity of wind would blow the train away too, but you get the idea that you can prevent, uh, you, you can get to a point where your footprint expands, where your velocity expands, such that your simple approximation you use at low velocities are no longer valid. Now, there's a lot of things I would have liked to put in here, but this video is going to get wickedly over time. Uh, there are other interferometer designs that can measure rotation relative to the reference frame. Those are called open area interferometers. All of them are listed here. Uh, it's, and then, for example, a fiber optic gyroscope is based on that principle. And the reason why it's called open arm because in the regular Michelson-Morley interferometer, there's no area between your beams. But if you make the beam go this way around a circle and come back, now you have open area here that will give you your velocity in a rotation so you can detect the rotation relative to the medium I'm off the camera sorry 
And did you notice that when charges are imbalanced, the cloak of relativity dissipates? Otherwise, how could have Heaviside been able to measure the contraction of the Coulomb field along its length? Because that system is out of balance. If it were in balance, you, would never, you could not be able to measure it. And um, I, I didn't need this thought experiment after all. I had it in the previous video and I said I'd talk about it, so now I have to fulfill my promise to talk about it. Um, what you have here is two spaceships leaving a stationary buoy at one quarter of the speed of light, and there's another buoy here that's going to shoot a light beam. And it's very easy to show that they're going to give you the same answer. And the reason why they're going to give you the same answer is because the only way you can measure light is with light. And so if you, these detectors would have to work on some principle like this. Okay, when the light beam passes one, it shoots another beam to start a timer over here, such that when this beam gets here, it shuts off the timer. But since light moves at the speed of light, both these beams are going to move together. So in one case, if you design it where the timer is on this side, in, uh, on, then you're going to get zero zero for both experiments. Okay, now if you design your thing the other way where, okay, when the light beam passes the first one, we're going to start the timer on this side. Then when the light beam passes this side, we're going to send a light beam back to stop the timer. Well, if you do it that way, then it doesn't matter which ship you measure it from, you're going to get the same answer because you're traveling at the same speed. And so that is what I was getting at before using the concept of the beam as opposed to the isotropic radiator, is there a problem in measuring light is light itself, because we need to use light to measure light. And so we have to be very careful how we devise our experiments, because we can get thrown off the case, uh, thrown off the uh, path. So let me do a recap. The Lorentz Fitzgerald length contraction compensates the Michelson Morley experiment based on its velocity relative to a medium. Thus, the existence of the medium was never disproved. It was only deemed unmeasurable. There's a lot of physicists out there that have been falsely taught that it was disproved. It most certainly has not been because the compensations are dependent upon the reference frame of the ether, uh, a reference frame. What do you want to call it, the ether or the zero point flux or the dark, whatever you want to call it doesn't matter. The point is your medium exists. The question, if we can't know our velocity relative to the medium, then how is it that we can apply the compensations to many things? In other words, we use that Lorentz Fitzgerald compens in a lot of other calculations. If we can't measure our velocity relative, what, how are we applying them? I think I know. I don't really care to go figure it out, but I leave that question with you if you want to answer that question on your own. And also I've shown that the compensations for the Michelson Morley will degrade at higher velocities, making the measurement possible. And also I've, sh I've shown that through what Heaviside did, that imbalanced charge experiments hold the key to detecting the velocity of medium at earthly speeds. Okay, so... So in the next video, we can hold on until after the new math construct paper is finished and released. Uh, the new videos are TBA. Uh, and thank you. I've been getting some more donations. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. If you want to donate, go to my website. My website's woefully out of date. I don't have time to work on it. Uh, go to my website. There's a donate button there. I appreciate the donations. I'm, I'm buying the materials for the experiments this summer with it. Uh, thank you very much.